If you're creating content without a strategic plan, with ideas and goals in mind, then you're creating content for content's sake, and you're going to fail. Let's talk about that. Hello, my name is Bill Arnold. I'm president of Prevail Marketing. You may find us at prevailmarketing.com. And every day we give you a video, we give you some guidance, some instructions, some understandings, some ways that you can improve your business through better sales and marketing. And for the last couple of days, we've been talking about content marketing because it is the framework, it's the foundation of every single thing you do. Yesterday, we introduced the concept to introduce the subject to how to create great content, where we introduced the, the idea that you need three basic elements if you're going to start creating content. You need to make sure the content's relevant. You need to make sure the content is distributed to where people go for information and education. And you need to make sure it's timed right, that, it's, that it, where they are in that buyer's journey, it correlates to that partic particular spot. Today, we're going to drill deeper down. We're going to talk about the content marketing formula, and we're going to talk about some of the basic foundations of things that need to be in place if you're going to, be, you're going to be, get it right, because you have to be strategic. You have to have a plan. Every piece of content you create has to be designated for a particular buyer persona at a particular spot in, their, in the buyer's journey, and you need to understand when you enter it what you think and what your expectations are they're going to do with that content, how they're going to react, how they're going to proceed, and how that's going to move them through that buyer's journey. So let's talk about the role that senior management needs to play. You know, senior management will go to marketing and say, look, we need to more organic leads. Please deliver them. Do what it takes. We hear this content marketing concept work. Go out and write a couple blogs. Do a couple ebooks, and, you know, and next week where I expect to see results. Well, if that's the concept you're running into, don't bother. It's not going to work. I tell my clients that content marketing if you do it properly, it's a four to six month duration before you see meaningful results. Four to six months of constant cr creation of content and distributing that content, optimizing that content, and nurturing people that come on board. That's the process. And, then, and I've had clients say, well, okay, I want that four months. I want four months. I don't want six months. Give me that four months. What does that look like? Well, I'm going to tell you what that looks like. What type of content you need to be creating if you want to see four months of Results, okay? First off, you need to create at least two ebooks, okay? One about 50 pages, one about 15 pages. You need to create at least 15 long form blogs using a pillar blog, cluster blog concept. You need to create a, at least 10 videos that are not commercial quality, but videos that similar to what I'm creating that talk about the problem. Now, all this has to be distributed, by the way. You need to create, create eight pieces of unique content. I'm talking about two to four page guides, I'm talking about infographs, I'm talking about one pagers. You need to create eight phase nurturing campaigns. And all of this, everything I talked about, has to be distributed in an omni-channel marketing program across all social platforms. That's a lot of work. That's every month for four months straight. You do that, and you will see results. Now, if you do less, you will still get results, but it's going to take time. Someone said, well, if I do twice of that, can I get it in three months? And I, I can't. I don't think you can either. It doesn't work that way. It takes, a while, it takes a while to build up that momentum. So if you want it in four months, that's the activity it's going to take. All right, let's talk about that senior management role. Let's provide those resources. Understand the time frame it's going to take to get those results. Let's talk about the content creation team, what the expectations have to be for them, because obviously they're creating it. The tendency for any content creator is, to occasionally phone a piece in, to create some fluff piece that, you know what, I've created some great pieces all week. This one I'm just going to phone in. I'm just going to give, uh, this is going to be a fluff piece. It's going to be, it's not really going to provide any great basis of anything, but I'm going to, I'm going to get that blog out today. Okay. Don't, don't bother with the blog if that's what it's going to be, because that may be the one piece, the one time a prospective client goes, looks at your blog and they see nothing but fluff a document that really has no validity to them, no meaning to them, but you tricked them somehow to come and you see it, you're going to lose that client. You're going to lose that prospect. So unless you're committed that every piece of content you produce will represent the company's quality and commitment and represent the best that you can do, don't bother doing it. You know, and this requires strict adherence to a content code that we like to suggest clients follow, that we follow, that's essential to follow if you're going to get results. It begins with being an expert. What do I mean by that? And you can't be an expert in everything, can you? Well, we have the bathtub of knowledge approach. What's that? So 
it's a painstaking process to become an expert, and it requires a lot of reading, a lot of interviews with, with experts, a lot of people who have great knowledge. Unless you're the subject matter expert yourself, you need to do your homework. You need to make sure you understand this issue as well as everybody else. It doesn't, even if you, if you think you have a cursory knowledge, that's not enough. You need to drill down and find out what you don't know. Because that's why people come there, for that information they don't know either. And if you always have that little twist, that little bit of information, they're going to say, ah, I'll learn something from them. I need to go back. So you need to drill down and fill that bathtub up with all this knowledge. And then you write your blog, your ebook, your article, whatever it is you're going to write, your two to four page guide. And then when it's all over, you drain the bathtub of all that knowledge. And you start all over again from scratch about the next topic. So, again, just writing great content is not enough, okay? So when you when someone's if you write great content, you got to follow other certain rules. One of the you got to recognize that most people have a very short attention span. I mean, I read somewhere that Microsoft did a study that said that the attention span of the average internet reader is is uh, eight seconds, which is which is less than a goldfish. I don't know if that's true, but that's what they reported, okay? So the first thing you need to do is grab their attention. And I'm going to date myself a little bit by talking the way I'm talking, but I think it's an important analogy. I used to talk about this back a number of years ago, that if you're walking down the street and you see a newspaper box with a newspaper in there and you see the headlines, that headline needs to be so compelling that you actually stop and walk back to look at it. Now, I don't know if there's new boxes out there anymore, but think about it on the Internet. If I'm scanning the Internet, I'm looking at different topics, I'm looking at different things on the Internet, and I see a subject matter that really entices me, and I'm starting to go past, I'm trying to scroll past it, or maybe I'm doing, seeing something on TikTok and I'm scrolling past. That's a better analogy now. I'm going to use that in the future. If I'm scrolling TikTok now, and I see something, I kind of flip by, and I thought, well, damn, I need to know what that is, and I come back, and I look at that. That is the type of power your headline has to have that I'm willing to retra- retrace my steps to go back and look at it. That's critical because that's what kind of headline is going to get their attention. It's going to compel them to take that next step, and that next step is so critical. When I open up that article, <clears throat> I've got to be, have immediate ratification that what I read was not clickbait. That what I read had some legitimacy to what that article said. If I read, I, how many times have you <clears throat> seen an article? I know I have. And wow, this is, oh my God, this is interesting. And you, and you go through the article and you cannot find any correlation between what that headline said and what's in the article. Clickbait, right? It can't be that. There has to be immediately be a recognition by that reader that they've hit the right place and you're going to be true to your word. You're going to talk about that and give them that information. That's important. The article itself has to be scannable. I mean, I don't know about you, but I never enter an article and just read the whole thing from front to back. I don't do that. I kind of scan that. I scan it to see, like, is it going to be interesting? Are there points of elements here that, I, that are worth my attention, worth my time, that I find of interest? How do you do that? How do you orchestrate that? Well, if you notice the blogs we write, there's lots of, lots of bullet points. Bullet points make points of interest stand out. I can scan the bullet point and say, oh, okay, a lot of bold, different color headlines. Every time I'm entering a new section or even internally within a section, I make sure that that headline is, is bold face. It's a different color. It draws your eyes right to it. So you say, oh, okay, this is what this is going to be about. And I see a paragraph after that, and I think maybe I'll just read that paragraph. But it basically has to be scannable because that's how we read content now. Nobody reads from front to back. We read it basically just scanning it, and if it's interest, we'll go back and peruse it some more. It's got to be readability. What do I mean by that? I mean, I've seen so many articles written by individuals who seem to want to impress me with their big words. It doesn't impress anybody. It doesn't impress anyone. In fact, it discourages people from reading it. So make sure, you know, I tell people write an eighth grade level. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care how much of an expert you are. If you're, reading, if you're writing something that the average person's got to use a dictionary to find, you're losing them, and they're not coming back. So make sure it's readable. You know, use an active voice. Active voice are best for all content. Use a passive voice just doesn't draw that attention. You know, the type of content you create is important, too. You know, a lot of this is going to be dictated by what you find in the buyer persona report because that's going to give you an indication you know, the buyer, the buyer persona report is going to give you a, a picture, a snapshot, an indication 
of what that particular buyer persona prefers to see as far as the type of content, the, the subject matter of content, where they go for information on third party verification. But here's a little secret. Buyer personas aren't absolute. Every individual is unique, and you can have outliers that are your customers that even though they have the same characteristics and outwardly appearances, they're not they are going to digest information differently. So you're going to create content that is really dedicated and, and diverse. And I'm going to talk about that for just a few seconds. You know, I tell people that long form articles, so such a thing as uh, eBooks and guides and uh, you know blogs. When I talk about long form blogs, at least 1,500 words, that should be 60% of the content you create. 60% of the content should be written word. And it should be long form. It should be meaningful because they're going to find more value than a short 600 word blog. It seems scammy, right? 30% of what you write should be videos. Or right, right. What you produce is videos. And it can be a combination of short form videos. You might find on TikTok and Reels and, uh, and other forms of other places or the long form you find on YouTube. The key about this and something I need to do better, honestly, is I need you need to make sure that when you put this video on your website where it belongs, not just on YouTube, you want it on your website. You may share it other places, but it's always find it back to your website, not to YouTube, unless you're an influencer and that's where you make your money. Always have a transcript of that. Why? Because Google actually can read the transcript and they can say, oh, it's about this. This, this video is going, even though you have a summary of the video and having a transcript, but you click on it, even if that transcript is sort of not, not a main page, is going to allow Google to give you more traffic. 10% should be infographics, pictorials, things of that content. All right, that's a kind of format. To, let's talk about the type of content. Again, buyer persona is going to dictate a lot of what you create, but I act to use the rule that, the modification of the rule that was done by Eric Smith back in 2005. He used from Google, for those who remember. It's a 70 20 10 rule where again, 70% of what I create is proven content. It addresses the pain point, interest, concerns of the target buyer persona. So I know I do that buyer persona analysis and 70% of what I create is taken from that buyer persona report. And I said the buyer persona needs to see this messaging, this type of content at this stage of the buyer journey, 70% of everything I create, be it videos, be it written documents, be it infographics, adheres to that what the buyer persona needs to see. That's the 70%. 20% uh, conscious be focused on the bottom of the funnel. Things that basically are showcasing, you know, the final stages. It's, you know, it's the, it's the uh, pricing comparison, the competitive comparison, the case studies, things that are basically the, the things, the one pages up sales. All those things I focus on is 20% of my content. The 70% is to get them down the pipeline, the buyer persona information, and 20% is going to be that final push over the edge. And 10% is experimental content. You know what? As I said, not every buyer persona incorporates, encompasses everybody that I'm trying to hit. So I try outliers. I try different things. I try out of the box. I have fun. I don't worry about fear of failure because I don't think it's going to work to begin with. But maybe, but maybe I'll catch that outlier. And maybe I'll learn something that I didn't know. Maybe that 10% actually resonates in a way I didn't suspect with that buyer persona or a group of buyer personas. So 10% is always experimental, 10% is being out of the box, being creative, and obviously you test everything. You test and you measure. So every time I create content, I don't care if it's the 70%, that is for the top of the funnel, which is based on the buyer persona, the 20%, which is for the uh, bottom of the funnel, or that 10% experimental portion. Everything is tested for results. It's measured. We test every metric, and that's how we learn how to modify the marketing plan, how to adjust, how to tweak, how to improve. That's a very basic overview. I've, in, the, in, the, uh, in the blog I created, I did point out some uh, tools we use specifically, so I'd recommend you go back and look at that. And we're going to continue this journey over the course of this week. But tomorrow we're going to take a little detour. We're going to talk about, it's kind of a detour, kind of not. We're going to talk about nurturing. Nurturing leads and best practice. We talked about creating content, getting them to here. I want to talk about what you need to do to nurture them once you get their attention. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. If this video was helpful to you, if you found it valuable, found it interesting, please like, please follow, please share, whatever platform you're on. Please comment if you have comments. But if you'd like to know more information about how your content marketing program can improve, how you can take and make it from being a creation of content for content's sake to a strategic plan, that is going to deliver results, 
fill out a form on our website. Give us a call. Follow up with an email. We'd be glad to have a conversation with you, offer you some guidance and some recommendations. So until tomorrow, you could be anywhere you want to be, and you're here today with us. So thank you for your time. I appreciate that, and see you soon.